let's say. Maybe you want to do it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Abuna Isaac Barry from Barry Science Lab, and today I just wanted to talk to you about a really cool new concept that I just discovered called the pigeonhole principle. Yes, the pigeonhole principle. So, basically, this is what it says. Let's say you have, uh, I don't know, six holes, and Let's say you have, let me draw a pigeon real quick. So here's our pigeon, I'm going to make it a little chubby. I know it looks like a duck right now, but uh, trust me, it's a pigeon. So this is just like some stuff. So here is our pigeon, right? And so what I'm gonna do is let's say we don't have just one of these, but let's say we have seven. So two, let's copy that. Four, let's copy that. Eight, and now we just erase one. So this is what the principle says. We have seven pigeons and six boxes. So this might seem quite obvious, but that means that more, uh, at least one of these boxes has to have more than one pigeon in it. So if I try arranging them, uh, let's just shrink them down a little bit more so that they fit in the box. It's lagging a little bit. So let's try arranging them. Hmm. So. Uh, if we put one pigeon in here, let's say. Why is it so laggy? One pigeon in here. One pigeon in here. Oh, one pigeon in here. One pigeon in here. And here's the final thing. Now, all of these have at least one pigeon. So where is this last one gonna go? Well, no matter where it goes, that hole is gonna have more than one pigeon. How can this be proved? Well, it's quite an obvious principle and it can be uh, done off intuition, but to really prove it, you gotta think about the contrapositive. So, the statement, the general statement of the pigeonhole principle is that if you have n pigeons and m holes such that n is greater than m, then one hole must have greater than one pigeon. Must contain more than one pigeon. And so how can we prove that? Well, we can use the contrapositive. What is the contrapositive? Well, it's basically like the opposite of a statement, but it's still true. I'll give an example because I know that it sounds confusing. If, uh, if you wanted to say he is very smart, the contrapositive would be he is not very stupid. Not is the opposite of is, or is not is the opposite of is, and smart is the opposite of stupid, but these two still say the same thing. That's what a contrapositive is. So, uh, we can take the contrapositive and basically say that if there are, I don't know, k holes, and each hole contains less than or equal to one pigeon, then there must be at most k pigeons. So there must be uh, less than or equal to k pigeons. So how is this statement true? Well, think about it. Uh, <clears throat> the max amount of pigeons we can have here if each hole has one pigeon would be for every hole to have one pigeon, and then to find the total number of pigeons, you multiply it by k because there were k holes. 
So that means that the maximum amount of, of pigeons in K holes, if there must be a less than one or equal to one pigeon in each hole, is K. So that is basically a proof of it. Kind of like the proof that we just saw over here. So now, how can this uh, such a simple, obvious principle be applied in a practical way? Well, let me give you a puzzle. Uh, suit, I need to draw a chessboard. Uh, okay. So, let's say I have a chessboard, which is going to look a little bit like this. So, I'm going to cover one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, not the most perfect test board, but it's passable. So now, I'm going to uh, just seed in. Uh, shoot, this is going to take a while. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly seed in some of the white squares. So they're going to look like this. And I know this is messy, but actually seeding them in would take a really long time. So... Uh, that's the thing. So here we go. Almost done. Uh, okay, and that's all our shading done. All right. So this is a chessboard. As you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows. Uh, columns and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows. So now you could easily tile this entire thing. You could easily cover this entire thing with a domino that is exactly the size of two squares and look like this. Obviously, the, uh, though, you could also orient them uh, horizontally. So Obviously, there's a very easy way to cover up this. It should be intuitive to you, uh, so I'm not going to show it. But now, let's say, see what happens if we take one square off. Can we still cover it with these dominoes? Well, uh, uh, can we cover it without the uh, two dominoes covering one square or a domino sticking outside the board? Well, the answer is no. And this is pretty easy to prove because the domino ha uh, can cover two squares, and this is an odd number of squares, 63, because we removed one square in the corner over here. So we can't cover 63 with two dominoes because 63 isn't an even number. So if it's not an even number, how about we make it even? What if we remove the opposite corner? Now, if it's 62 dominoes and 62 is, uh, is divisible by 2, then do you think we can tile this plane with the dominoes without overlapping dominoes or uh, the dominoes sticking out? Well, the answer is no. And I want you to try and figure out why. Five, four, three, two, pause the video for more time. All right, let's think about this. Why can't we do this? Well, let's take a smaller example. What if we had for example, a two by two chessboard. So if you put a domino on this guy, it would be pretty clear that it covers both a white and a black square. And it will always do that because a domino will cover two adjacent squares and uh, adjacent squares will always be white and black. They will never be the same color. So that means to tile the plane, these dominoes need the same amount of white tiles as black tiles. But now, let's count how many white tiles versus black tiles there are. Well, we removed two white tiles in the corner here. So, there would be 30 white tiles, but 32 black tiles. 
Which means that we can't fit 32 dominoes into 30 light squares. Two, uh, at least uh, two of them have to be overlapping somewhere. So that means that we cannot tile this plane even though there's an even number of squares. Let me give you another example. And this one's a really fun one. Let's say... Maybe you want to do it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say you have a globe, right? And uh, I'm not going to draw the continents because they have no use here. So, if you took any five points on the globe, could you find a hemisphere that connects, uh, that has four of the five points in it? Can you, uh, now obviously for this one you can, the dividing line would be about over here. But the question is, can you do that for any five points on a globe? And, and the answer is yes. Well, I'm going to give you a few seconds to figure out why. Five, four, pause the video for more time, two, one. Okay, well, first we can start by saying that uh, we can always make an equator that will connect two of the points. Like, for example, we can connect these two points on one equator. And if they're on the dividing line, they still technically count as in one hemisphere or the other. So that's two of the points covered. And now we have two hemispheres and only three points remaining. Can you see how we can apply the pigeonhole principle now? Well, that's right. We can basically say that there are two holes and three pigeons, or more generally, just three objects. So that means that two of these points have to be in one hemisphere. And in this case, we lucked out because all three of these points were in this hemisphere. So that's it for the pigeonhole principle. Thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you in the next